This is an amazing little facility here. I love this. Um, so I always get nervous when I come to Washington because I'm most definitely not a policy person as I look around at my policy-minded friends. Uh, I'm a business person. I've done my share of growing and, yes, milking. And, and I sit on lots and lots of boards and lots of spaces. But um, once the policy questions start flying, I'm going to be pointing to a few friends in the audience who will bail me out here. Uh, but I'm really here to commit to contribute some perspectives as a business person who's been in this space um, since some of you were born, um, before some of you were born, I should say. 1977 was my first uh, real um, job in the organic space. And again, I've, I've, I'm now on boards of uh, everything from whey and, um, and veg vegan protein to uh, plant-based alternatives, even yogurt alternatives, imagine that. Uh, to organic beer and confections. And, you know, Kathleen just already sort of stole my thunder because I was going to say I, I view the organic sector the way I view standards, which is it's a continuous improvement process. It's never, a, we've never arrived and we never will arrive. It's a constant, um, you know, we still have a whole lot of work to do to, to evolve to a really mature economic sector. But I think it's important to take stock of what we have achieved. And also, I want to talk to some of the challenges ahead and, 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 um, uh, dip my toes a little bit in the policy space because there's obviously some immediate work that, ne that is needed. So you, you have to understand 1983, um, organic, right? This, it, at that time, it meant that you had to chew extra. Okay, you got the, you know, remember the dark, dirty, natural food stores? You're laughing because you visited them with me. But, I mean, it was a different kind of world. And somewhere around the mid, late 80s, late early 90s, we kind of all realized we're in the food business. Those of us in the food business, obviously, we have personal care and and uh, and and uh, the apparel uh, organic sectors of the, those two uh, industries also have been dynamos in growth. But um, but we kind of realized it was about taste and it was actually food and we needed to taste great. And when that happened, we actually started to take off. Uh, but those moths flying over the broccoli and the extra chewable bread back then was when I started. And, and so what that meant is I always say about Stonyfield, we had a wonderful company. Back then, we just said no supply and no demand. And that's really kind of the case. But since 2000, when the industry was really beginning to finally mature, uh, not incidentally, because we f finally had federal standards, we had a unified standard, um, although, uh, as you know, it took a bit longer to get into uh, commerce. But nevertheless, we were at about 5.1 billion in 2000 in total sales. and. In 2017, we're just shy of 50 billion. It's pretty clear that we crossed the 50 billion dollar mark. The numbers will be out soon uh, in 2018. So that's you need to understand that's a 14 percent compounded annual growth rate, which in my terms and in my world, the food business is unheard of. There's nothing out there that has grown at that consistent rate year after year, and now decade after decade. Uh, just last year, Nielsen Insights, uh, Kathleen was referencing Nielsen, but they reported that organic was actually one of the top five sectors across the whole um, uh, FMCG uh, uh, industry. So, uh, and it was up 9% in dollar sales in retail last year. Again, extraordinary considering that most categories, and I just spoke to 100 dairy farmers in Vermont uh, last week, um, and you, you're, I'm sure, aware that uh, conventional dairy is actually in decline right now. Organic is not. It's growing. But nonetheless, almost all food categories are either flat or in slight decline. So to have had a 9% dollar growth last year is, is quite amazing. And that's no, that's no wonder that we have 82% of the US households now purchasing some organic products regularly. Um, now that report, the Nielsen report, went on to show some other really interesting demographic um, trends, which I don't think will be a surprise as I look around the room here. One is Hispanic consumers uh, drove growth uh, in terms of ethnic groups. Um, highest growth in household spending, as well as the highest percentage of organic purchasing of any group. And obviously, since this is the fastest growing demographic in America, this is really bodes well for those of us in this space. And then likewise, generationally, millennials, of course, uh, drove it. Um, fastest growth, highest percentage again. Um, currently, now 25 to 26 percent of millennials have kids. And so within the next 10 to 15 years, 80% are expected to become parents. That's about 60 million new organic consumers coming along. So again, another good sign. Um, I have three millennials. I'm sure a bunch of you do. Um, and you know, I can, I can tell you, uh, 
you know, th this is not a generation that needs to be lectured about climate change or toxins. They understand, and more than that, they understand the power of their consuming dollar. Um, now, it's also kind of interesting because they're the most debt-ridden generation probably in history due, due to all, you know, college and university costs and healthcare costs and so on. And yet they're still buying organic. But what they're doing, and I see it in my own family, uh, but we also see it in our, in our consumer trends, they're buying less of the more expensive items, so le le less frequent consumption of meat, for example, and dairy, but much more on the vegetable end of the spectrum and fruits, cereals, grains, um, and of course plant-based alternatives that are exploding. Um, in my category, uh, uh, cow milk, just broadly, yogurt sales uh, were down in the first quarter of 2019 by about $38 million versus a year ago. But plant-based alternatives are up uh, by about $10 million for the same period. So there's definitely a shift happening, and, and it is being driven by uh, millennials. When we look at, um, when Stonyfield looks at the consumer, we see uh, a couple million consumers who buy our Yo Baby yogurt. That's, that's our, probably our, honestly, most of our growth is in, the, is in kids' lines these days. Adult is not growing anywhere near as fast. Uh, so we have a couple million consumers, moms primarily, who buy. Uh, that's a subset of about four or five million moms who buy organic yogurt generally, uh, which is a subset of about 16 million moms who buy wellness products. Um, and that can mean everything from non-GMO, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes, to whatever, whatever. It's a, obviously not a federal standard like we have with organic. Uh, but that's also a subset of 45 million moms who, of course, want the best for their children. So again, you know, I think you can see why my wife calls me a pathological optimist, but you can see why I'm you know, upbeat about the prospects for organic, despite you know, pesky reporters like the one last week. And I obviously agree with you, Kathleen, on this one. I mean, Stonyfield was the very first organic company to sell to Walmart back. You know, nowadays, I, I try to not, I, I can't remember what year anything happened anymore. I just try to remember which decade. So this was the early 90s. And uh, as you might imagine, I took a lot of grief from my left, especially in New England, over that, uh, you know, selling out to big, bad Walmart. But Walmart, as I think most people know now, is uh, number one or two uh, seller of organic produce in this country. And we sold to Walmart for the very reason Kathleen said, is we didn't, ne organic never set out to be food for the elite. And many, many people can only afford to buy at Walmart, and why shouldn't they have the same access? And plus, of course, the bigger the demand, the more the supply chain, the more the infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. But just when you, just to make one last point about millennials, uh, the, the uh, Pew research is showing 75% of millennials now willing to pay more for what they call sustainable offerings, and 66% are willing to pay more from companies committed to positive social and environmental practices. So this is a positive group for organic. Now I will tell you, um, we did a consumer inter intercept um, last year, and uh, the, and then we pooled data. We I I'll, at the end I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the grow the the voluntary checkoff program that. Um, uh, we're all engaged with here, and a uh, particular group uh, uh, focused on the promotion side with Organic Voices, which I chair. And I gathered together about 20 chief marketing officers from all of the leading organic firms in the country to pool insights as we try to figure out, you know, we're, we're, one of the big problems um, in growing the organic sector has been caused by us, because we're so passionate about all the many values and attributes of organic. We talk about all of them. And it overwhelms the poor consumer. And especially when you have a little yogurt label this big, you know, and you're jamming all those messages in. It's you know, carbon sequestration and farmer pay price and, and uh, pesticide reductions and balance of trade and you know, all the things that we all believe and are excited about. So we pooled our insights. And, um, and then we did some research. And the, and, and the millennial consumer that I'm spending a little time talking about here, and you'll understand why in a few minutes, uh, we, we got three key insights uh, from this group. One is abject, utter, um, uh, 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 um, not disrespect, what's the word I want to use? Um, distrust of institutions. Obviously government, but also uh, companies. If a company talks, they don't listen. You know that skip ad thing that you get every time you on your phone? Those, that button is the most pushed button you know, in this age group. So number two is incredible confusion. 
uh, what's the difference between organic and fair trade and regenerative and not? And we'll, I'm sure, talk about that in the discussion. Um, but the third and the real key is that uh, absolute confidence that they can get whatever information they want and need uh, right at their fingertips. And of course they can. Anybody who has a millennial kid knows they run circles. I mean, I'm constantly asking my kids, how do I do this and that? But, but the point is, is that you know, that's for better and for worse, right? Because obviously data coming through um, uh, the web is not always uh, reliable. Um, so uh, what I want to say, though, is that broadly when you kind of look at these uh, trends, uh, you can see that even in tough categories like milk, like dairy, um, you know, last year white milk uh, sales declined uh, well, actually, over four years, declined in 2013 to 2017 by over 70 million gallons. Uh, and in contrast, organic milk sales actually grew during that period. So you see even now it, it, it uh, had about a 4.7% CAG, or not as strong as organic in general. But still, obviously, organic has favored. And this is why the organic dairy farmers in, in, in my part of the world are doing a heck of a lot better than conventional farms. Um, we are paying our organic farmers right now double the price right this quarter, double the price that conventional uh, farmers are getting. And of course, you can't make money on the price that they're getting for conventional. That's why we lost 13.5% of our uh, conventional dairies last year. So what's behind the trends? Um, you know, First, co concern about chemicals in the food supply is, has never been greater. And you see it in all kinds of data of the more than 1,000 American adults in the International Food Information Council Foundation's annual survey, the last four or five years, uh, numbers between 34 and 36 percent said chemicals in food is the more important, is the most important food safety issue. Even it's sort of trading places. In 2015, it was outpacing uh, foodborne in, in, illness from bacteria. Uh, last year, it was a close second. But anyways, it's the numbers have been up 13, 14, 15 percent annually. And why is that? Because what people are seeing in the media because we're finally getting some science correlating um, these data. You know, back in 2007, the President's Cancer Panel uh, announced that uh, one in two men and one in three women were going to get cancer, American men and women were going to get cancer in our lifetimes. Um, and they uh, uh, said that the primary uh, cause is inadvertent exposure to chemicals in our everyday life. I mean, it was declared by this prestigious panel of oncologists. Um, we uh, now know that uh, you know something north of 90 percent, uh, thanks to EWG, 90 percent of conventional oats contain glyphosate. Um, even our spear drinkers are now in trouble. If you saw the PERG uh, study last month uh, showing wines and beers, uh, glyphosate, if you're drinking Jingdao beer, you might want to think twice. Um, as you go down the list of uh, glyphosate and parts per billion, uh, there were virtually, I mean, uh, essentially almost no beers were devoid of glyphosate because it's, as we now know, uh, you know, Roundup is everywhere. It's in the 90 to 100 percent of the rainfall in the Midwest during growing seasons. Um, by the way, I have to say proudly, proud uncle that I am, the only beer in America that, had, that was tested that had zero parts per billion of glyphosate is my nephew's beer, Peak Organic. So get yourself some Peak Organic. Do we have it here? Maybe not. OK, all right, all right, sorry. We won't go analyze who else is on the table over there. Uh, but look, we now know, uh, again, EWG's pesticide analysis uh, found pesticide residues on nearly 70% of conventional produce tested. Strawberries uh, now, I mean, this is the depressing part of the discussion. I'll move past this. But 99% of strawberries tested have pesticide residues. Up to 22 different pesticides were found on one single strawberry. Um, Environmental health perspectives, last year, a series of studies saw a link between prenatal exposures to OP, organophosphate pesticides, and lower IQ scores. We're literally making ourselves less intelligent. Exposure to common insecticides and pesticides published in this peer-reviewed journal in the womb showed that a child's IQ could be reduced by 4 to 7 percent before they reach school children in school age in, in comparison to uh, children with lower levels of exposure. Uh, in the last three years alone, uh, we've seen research showing that working in conventional ag fields or even just living in areas near conventional farms can harm re reproductive health, linked with respiratory illness, 
in children, rheumatoid arthritis, coronary heart disease, renal disease, Parkinson's, prostate cancer, thyroid cancer, et cetera, et cetera. So again, this younger generation of consumers, we don't have to give that lecture anymore. Uh, they live this way. Everybody uh, of this millennial age knows somebody with cancer. Most of us my age can't say that when we were their ages, but we certainly can now. And lastly, just in terms of the sort of, you know, the stick part of this, and I'll get to the carrot uh, in a moment. In, in March of 2018, um, there was a report, um, exposures to chemicals and biomonitoring at, at CDC. They found that children, children 6 to 11 had significantly higher levels of residues in their urine of, of multiple pesticides than adults. And even more worrisome, uh, chlorpyrifos and other OP Insecticides were found in almost 99% of children tested at some level or another, whether you're in a farm belt or not. So, you know, I could go on with these, but you see, this is what's happening, and it's out there in the media, and it's now being peer reviewed, and, and uh, again, we have science correlating these, these concerns. So, but we've got carrots as well. It's not all about sticks. Um, you know, on animal care, which when you look at the drivers, if you go into consumer interception, you look at what's the driver of this whole plant-based explosion? Number one is humane treatment of animals or, or just simply not wanting to support uh, animal agriculture. Uh, we know now, though, uh, clinically, that uh, organically raised dairy cows live twice as long as conventional cows. So if you're a dairy farmer, your prime asset lives twice as long. That's a pretty darn good thing. Uh, which cow do you want to buy your milk from, right? And this is... Our vets, and we again support almost 2,000 dairy farmers. Uh, the veterinarians are kind of like the Maytag salesmen back in my days. You know, they just literally, the animals don't get sick on these farms. And when they do, um, they're usually quite treatable. Um, but again, published data, w uh, women reporting, reported eating two or more servings per day of produce with higher pesticide residues. Uh, were 26% li likely to have a successful pregnancy, or in converse, uh, those who were eating more regular uh, organic were having uh, more successful, uh, less, less troubled pregnancies. Um, and we also know that eating organic not only helps to avoid exposure, but we also know that when kids switch to an organic diet, it doesn't take long before the metabolites of pesticides disappear from their urine. Three to six-year-olds literally in one week can, can purge their systems just by eating. And, Recently, you, you, I'm sure you all saw the study that showed the pesticide levels in families dropping by 60% of one, after one week of eating organic foods. So some of these studies are subjective, and they absolutely should be criticized. The French study, uh, um, which was published in JAMA, to be clear, um, that followed 70,000 adults for five years. Nevertheless, and most of them women, and again, it was subjective. The, the, you, know, you had to sign, check off whether you were eating organic food. It was not... It was not um, uh, statistical, but nonetheless, the consumers who checked off eating organic food regularly had 25% fewer cancers than those without. This is what's out there now, and this is what's driving a lot of this. So you've got the sort of, you know, the positives and the, and, and the, like I say, the sticks and the carrots. But we also know organic milk has 62% more omega-3 fatty acids for those for whom that's an issue. We know that organic crops have higher antioxidant levels. Um, and so we do have now a body of data, unlike when I was you know, starting out and it was just kind of aspirational and revolutionary and all of those things that uh, Kathleen was describing. So just to kind of wrap up so we can get to the discussion, let me, let me just say that um, you know, I'm bullish, obviously. I see, I see great things happening in the sector. Um, and I see it really only going our way. It's now 5.4% of US food, Laura, I think. Is that the? number and you know we're aiming for double digit and we're, I think we're certainly going to see it in my lifetime and, um, and with good reasons. Um, but you know let me just talk to the challenges and, the, and, the, and, 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 and I'd like to just kind of get to several key points that I think are, we must address in organic and then we'll have a discussion. Um, you know the first is um, as, a, as, a, as a business person, as a brand, as a processor, my job is to make sure that I'm balancing the, the benefits to the farmer and the benefits to the consumer. I have to make sure both are benefiting. And right now that's tough because I've got a long waiting list of conventional farmers trying to convert to organic because they can't make it. Um, and, and when your average age is 58 years old as a dairy farmer 
and you're seeing your price caving in. Um, I mean, I literally have farmers, you know, in tears talking to me quite regularly because they don't see their kids being able to continue their fourth, fifth, sixth generation farm. But we can't take the milk right now because we have right now, uh, as I said, you know, organics growing but not growing as it used to. So, um, you know, my job then is to serve the farmers. I have to be, I have to win on taste. <coughs> Because I've got to get to that, remember the 45 million moms, not the four. That's, I have to get to the next group to help the farmers. I've got to be the most convenient. My pricing has to be reasonable and, and within some reach. Um, you know, when I, I must say, you know, uh, when I see that Post article and, and the many that come out always attacking organic, I wonder when somebody's going to write the article about what's going on with conventional dairy farming and why we're not supporting our family farmers and why my competitors, why Chobani and YoPlay are getting away with paying farmers less than what it costs them to actually produce and putting these farmers at great risk. And you know how they're making it. They're making it by, they're living off their depreciation. Conventional farmers are not painting their barns. They're not taking care of their fences. Their equipment is old and so forth. Organic dairy farmers are the only ones actually able to make a profit. Slim as it is, they're, they're still able to make it. And we need to you know, take a bigger scope here and shine a light on what's going on out there. But, um, but in order, you know, this, this challenge is, if you're following what I'm saying here, as a processor, I'm paying 100% more for milk, which is my primary cost. But my, I can't charge 100% more for my cup or my tube or my drink or my you know, pouch of yogurt, right? So I've got to balance to the, I've got to make sure the consumer is getting a price. So that's a tough, tough balancing act. And, you know, the growth of organic, every retailer in America will tell you, it's, again, top three, top four, top five. From, and, and we just came back from Natural Products Expo West, where every major grocer in America, you know, from Walmart to Kroger and Target and Costco and obviously all the natural foods, the co-ops and so forth were there. And, and they'll tell you this is where the growth is, and that's what they, why they were there in larger numbers than ever before. But, you know, because of this growth and then the growth in capital, because there's an absolute... Uh, explosion of venture capital in our space. Um, there's now a lot larger companies and retailers, and that means they do bring this more traditional approach to business than might have been common in, in you know when I was starting out. But they all, they bring huge advantages because of scale. There's all kinds of efficiencies that come when a General Mills or a Danone or a Lactalis or a Kroger or a Costco are in the space. Um, and what I often explain to my farmers is. Look, I'm going to try to support your price, but the way, but I need, I need to cluster around a route because I need to get my transportation costs low. That way, I don't, I don't penalize you, but I can be efficient. Well, that's what happens with scale. So those, and there's a hundred examples of scale that, of course, we, we all could understand. But this increased competition in the marketplace and the increased challenge, return on investment challenges because there's so much money coming in. And some of the valuations, I'll be the first to tell you, and I've benefited from them, but they're absurd, right? Three, four times top line sales that these venture VCs and, and large strategics are, are, um, are putting in. But that makes it, it, it puts a lot more pressure on the marketplace and it puts a lot more pressure on, uh, on price. And so again, you have this balancing act all the time. And of course, retailers also, I just should say quickly, are also under huge pressure because e com is now such a big part of the overall marketplace, but especially in organic. You can now get an organic kiwi you know, brought to your home and, and the same day. Um, so what's happening with us in the space as we try to do this juggling act between the supplier and the consumer is we're also having the, the second, highest, uh, second highest cost in my business going up, which is trade spending which is the gap between the list price and the actual, what we actually get. In other words, what you have spent on in-store, on slotting fees and promotion and so on and so forth. And, you know, you can't blame the retailers. This is, this is the money is there for them to get. They need it because it's so competitive, but it does put pressure on us. So I just want you to have a sort of a sense of what the challenges are. So just to wrap up, there are five areas I, I feel that we as an organic community and industry need to prioritize as we think about building a strong future for organic. Um, one, and obviously this is not the crowd I need to preach this to, we, we've got to keep the bar high uh, on organic. This, it, it's the strangest industry, honestly. It's the only one I know in the world that has fought for more government regulation 
Um, but we need it. Because once we had a federal standard, that's when our industry took off. Once, once you could say with credibility and with enforcement that there is a there there, as opposed to a lot of these other standards that you know, don't, there's no, I mean, the word natural means exactly nothing. There's ice creams out there that don't change shape when they melt, but they say natural on the label, right? And, and, and you know, we're dealing with this with regenerative and, and so on. I mean, I, I, I told Kathleen when I came in here there, at the Natural Products Expo, there was a corn chip that had Butterfinger on the insides, Butterfinger candy. Now, why it was there, I'm not exactly sure. I still need an answer. But it said non-GMO on the label. But it wasn't the butterfly. It wasn't the you know, certified, inspected non-GMO. It was just some words. And this is why you know, young people don't trust us, because we're, you know, it's obviously pure bull. I'm, I'm, anyways, I, I, I digress. But, um, but we need to keep our regulations strong. And we've got to fix them where needed. And we've got to hold all farmers and processors uh, to the same high bar. Now, the 2018 Farm Bill was a good bill for organic. Uh, contains new provisions to help USDA fight fraud, uh, especially in imports. And Stonyfield's also participating in the new organic fraud prevention program launched by OTA, which is exceptional and needed and important. And we're getting more and more companies signing up. Um, in, in organic dairy, there's two uh, really major areas where enforcement is needed. Um, the first is on this origin of livestock rule. I don't know how many of you understand this, but we can get into it in the discussion if you want. But bottom line is um, we need a firm rule. There's, farmers can um, grow their calves uh, elsewhere on non-organic feed and then bring them onto the farm for a year. So they can get, this loophole allows for really uh, getting away with much lower costs. Uh, and of course, it breeds cynicism and you know, is this really an organic calf? And, so on and so forth, and, and, and we just need a final rule. It's very simple. We, we've, you know, we're asking the USDA to help uh, get this done, and, and when it happens, it will solve the problem once there's a rule. Um, the second area where more consistent enforcement is really needed is the pasture rule, and you know, I think you're aware consumers expect organic dairy operations to be grazing their cows, and, and the regulations require it, but we don't have great data on compliance, quite frankly. There's tons of anecdotes, there's lots of rumors, and there's always some article flashing out there saying, you know, this, these folks don't put them on pasture. And we, we, we need to make sure all certifiers who inspect organic dairies are trained to look at that. A lot of the inspectors uh, aren't dairy people. You know, if you're a dairy person, you can go and you can pretty much figure out if the cows are on grass or not. But it's, so we need better training, we need um, better data, and obviously enforcement. Um, now, um, uh, I won't go off into the CAFOs and organic, but we could talk about that if you want. But again, there are, you know, this, the organic livestock and poultry practices rule also is, is it's been withdrawn. It needs to come back. Um, this uh, OTA is, in fact, suing the USDA to force implementation of the rule. Um, you know, we have a pretty high bar for animal welfare in organics, but again, I listened to an earful with the farmers last Thursday. Uh, there's some you know, with larger scale CAFO type operations not necessarily complying. And, and again, um, the lack of the new rule allows uneven enforcement, you know, that may vary from region to region, inspector to inspector, and we need that to, we need that to be fixed. Um, second area, and the others I'll be quick, um, research. Uh, research is our lifeblood. Uh, research on organic production practices, breeding for crops, livestock, animal health, uh, understanding the benefit, the environmental benefits of organic, we're getting some good data out there, but obviously, um, you know, comparing runoff and nitrogen migration and so forth, we're doing a lot of that at UNH's organic dairy in New Hampshire, and there's other leaders around the country, but we need more. And again, the farm bill, this was a big win for us. Um, you know, the funding for the organic research uh, extension initiative uh, was raised to $50 million annually. Um, by 2022, and it's also now secure so that the next time if the farm bill gets stalled, we don't have to start with zero again, which is, you know, heaven, honestly. It's absolutely essential. Um, and then we have this checkoff program, this voluntary checkoff program, which is really exciting. Uh, we didn't get approval from the USDA to pursue the, proceed with the mandatory checkoff, but the voluntary, which will cover uh, research funding, uh, self-funded, um, Will um, right now our focus is technical assistance and training for farmers transitioning with organic grain production, uh, in an effort to increase 
domestic grain production, which um, and reduce our reliance on imports. But but there's a lot of research priorities that we hope to self fund. Um, third, I know I don't have to belabor this, is just supporting the next gen of organic farmers. Our, organic farmers are no different than conventional. Average farmer age 58 years old. Uh, average, average. You know, think about that, right? And so in New Ham in New in uh, Maine, we Stonyfield and others have funded this. Our uh, Wolf Neck, Wolf's Neck Center, we have organic dairy farm apprentices on the farms. Uh, we had a farmer uh, tip over his tractor last winter and um, had a, a life-threatening uh, uh, injury. And one of the pr apprentices stepped right off the apprenticeship program and ran his farm for the rest of the winter. This is really exciting. And, and, and we have some master grazers up there, and we have some real opportunities to grow that next gen. We need more funding for it, but it's, it's really powerful. Um, the fourth is consumer education, and uh, obviously, you know, educating consumers about the science, the data, the, 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 the verifiable, credible, real stuff is, is key. Um, we know consumers are really confused when it comes to the meaning of organic certification, and, you know, we've been addressing this for a really long time. We find influencers and bloggers are one of our most powerful uh, ways of doing this. I, uh, oh, can I grab that slide? Um, yeah, so this is a fun uh, little piece of media that the OTA put out last fall. Uh, you may have seen this ad in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, as I mentioned before, I'm now chairing a group that has uh, 90 companies in it as part of the GROW program, where the uh, Organic Voices, we're the promotion program. And we've just sort of picked up on that ad and said, uh, look, um, you know, with all the circular firing squad stuff and all the attacks out there, you know, this, this is not debatable that these 700 chemicals are prohibited. Uh, we're not saying whether they're present or not, because again, without at testing of every last product of every, you can't, but, but this is, there are 700 reasons uh, to go with organic, and you'll, you'll be seeing this campaign rolling out. We rolled it out at Expo to great, um, uh, great uh, joy for a lot of folks there, except for the non-organic folks, but it's certainly great for the organic people. Um, but it's, uh, you know, this is, this is, crucial for us to be educating what organic is and what organic isn't. And I want to stress what it isn't. You know, we're not saying organic is residue free, because you can't. When glyphosate's in 90% of your rainfall, um, you know, you can't say you're residue free. Although my, my nephew's beer can. Um, <laughs> anyhow, the last thing, and I'll, I'll just uh, close on this. You know, I, I was in New Hampshire the last couple days, and as you might imagine, you're now bumping into presidential candidates on every street corner. It's I mean, you could literally meet three a day if you want up there, and, and yesterday I did. Um, and, but unlike other campaigns, in, and I've, I've lived there my whole life, they're all talking about climate change, um, and it's really refreshing. You know, we're not debating the science now. I mean, some are, but these folks aren't. Um, but, you know, we know climate change prevents a real threat to agriculture around the world. I'm um, running an organic farm in New Zealand where we just had the worst drought uh, you know the fires in California. We have the opposite in northern New England. We've had flooding. Uh, fields are going to be under for a long time this spring. Um, and so the weather's becoming really unpredictable, and that's really tough on farming of all sorts. So you know, we need to act fast as a society, but we do know that organic has, its, has a major contribution. Um, a study in 2017 by the Organic Center at Northeastern University found that organic systems are storing 26% more carbon on average than conventional which of course is the point of organic, right? Building soils. Uh, we need to be uh, promoting this and we need to be growing it for this reason. If there's really, uh, my actual academic background is in climate science and you know, I don't think it's debatable that there's no way we're going to reverse slow or reverse climate change without taking carbon out of the atmosphere and sequestering it and that's what organic does. So that for me would be the fifth priority. So I've yacked at you long enough. Uh, I think we're gonna just have some discussion and some questions. So thank you. Okay. Thank you.